before I open questions and answers for a section, I will give you some time to think about your questions, and I will very briefly go through the Czech reflection. This is just to remind things which uh, most of you probably know, or some poorly know. So let me say that the uh, Czech Republic has a large number of small schools. The average size of uh, school in Czech Republic is much, much smaller than school in the US. It's quite important if we talk about manage, managing something. Uh, this means that we need many school principals. It's one uh, implication. The school principals are elected uh, by um, a system where finally municipal uh, head, the mayor, has the major say. This is so, so mostly people who don't know much or ed anything about education and schooling and so on. Uh, most, we don't know so much about uh, school principals, but the general wisdom is that most of them come from teachers, being teachers simply promoted, simply forced to apply for uh, being a teach, uh, principal. Uh, since the governance of educational system is very decentralized, many people think it's not so, but the Czech system is very decentralized, and the person who is responsible for almost everything is the principal. <laughs> yeah. If you look at international comparisons, Czech print school principals are in charge of most things which are appear in all these tables, uh, but most of them are of administrative type. So Czech school principals <coughs> are mostly bureaucrats, administrators. They are not what Steve described here as, uh, how you call it? Instructional leaders. Yeah, instructional leaders. Uh, but this is uh, uh, information based on fragmented pieces of information. Uh, Observations are not much used, uh, so school principals are not supervised by anybody except just school in inspection, but it's mostly, again, very, very, some kind of administrative supervision. Uh, the municipal councils, I think most of them do not supervise school principals other than accounting and uh, the quality of the building and the safety rules, <laughs> these things. Uh, these times, but I think it's longer, trend that it's difficult to attract uh, principals at all to find and especially good school principals to the profession uh, and uh, there is not much debate about uh, having better school principals in um, social uh, lagging regions. I haven't heard about this, such a debate that we need better school principals or better teachers for socially economically lagging regions. So I just repeated the list of facts I am aware of. So, I think you had plenty of time to think about questions, but not to me. I, I'm here all the time, but uh, to <laughs> Professor Rifkin. So, the floor is open for you. Hi, uh, so a lot of what you said was focused on uh, so, so a lot of what you said was focused on uh, measuring impact or effects of relying on standardized testing on some or on some other kind of testing. Uh, I think that uh, there is there there doesn't have to be any discussion on whether we can or cannot rely on our standardized testing to reach a conclusion. I think I think that we cannot really. Uh, so my question is, uh, how do we, or how can we measure the impact here uh, without having that tool that uh, you use in the US? You mean without having the standardized tests? Without, without being able to rely on them. So I, th I think that, that it, it's complicated in a way because one of the most important things I think that we found in the, that has been found in the US is that if you don't have measures of the students' work, then it's quite straightforward to, for schools to say, we're doing a wonderful job. You know, or for me to, to evaluate Daniel and say, Daniel's doing a wonderful job as a teacher. And he may be, he may not be, but I think it's really important to have measures of what the students know. Now, in the absence of standardized tests, 
There are, you know, there are other kinds of tests that can be used. Kids are taking assessments all the time. And so you can, you can certainly um, see how well a, a students are learning. And the principals can certainly start observing the teachers. And I think the challenge is, as Daniel pointed out <coughs> here, is I think it's really important that someone is making sure that the school head is working to have, um, you know, to have a better school and is willing to, you know, take those steps that are necessary to evaluate teachers, to support them, to do other things in the school to make it a better place to learn, a more, a warmer place, a safer place, all of those things. I think there's value to having some standardization in tests because um, it, it prevents the kind of cheating, even if you have, it's not exactly cheating, but even if you have some assessment, the principal can say, look, our kids are doing so well. You know, everyone's getting an A or B on these tests. We must be learning great. And then they move on to the next level of education outside of this school, and they don't do very well. So the other thing I think that's important and I think should be put into U.S. systems as well is there should be information on how well the kids do once they move on to the next level. Because even though you can't, even though that is into the future, it should still be um, kept track of. And I think it should have some influence on, on how that, that school system is rated. Yeah. <laughs> I have another question. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> okay, thank, thank you for an answer. I really appreciate it. Uh, another thing that was very, uh, very interesting for me was that you were mentioning student surveys, and I, I dived like a while ago. I dived a lot into uh, research on how student feedback can, on on teachers teachers teaching can have influence on uh, raising the quality of the teaching. Could you maybe elaborate on that a bit more about how you use student surveys in your uh, in, in the measurement of, uh, of the impact? So we have we have some student survey responses. We use the teacher survey responses more, but but I think student and family surveys, you know, can be important elements, particularly where you don't have, you know, you know, you have less reliable tests, because there's some external view of the schools. They're not great. You know, schools could become, as you know, a popularity contest, right? And how do you rate your teacher? How do you rate your teacher when you're in the university? Um, a lot of people rate them more on how nice they are or how funny they are. But I think asking good questions to students, you can elicit the kinds of responses that will provide you with information about what's happening in the school educationally. So I don't know much about surveys, but I think there are a lot of thoughtful people who do. And I think it's very important that the families really have ownership over what happens in the schools their kids go to. And this is one way to empower them. Thank you for this very interesting lesson on the story again. And I have one question. <coughs> I'm still keeping thinking about the Air Force One in Texas. <laughs> and you discussed uh, a lot about the uh, teachers, about the uh, principals, but what about the superintendents, who are effective superintendents? This is a rather academic question for us, as we have no districts, so we have no superintendents. But anyway, I would be interesting interested in, in your opinion who are effective superintendents. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's really interesting. We've, we've started to try to, to study that because I think that this governance hierarchy is really important. Because if the superintendent is not skilled at selecting good principles, at creating a good environment in that school district, then there's no reason for the system to persist as being good or to move from being not so good to, to much better. And it doesn't sound here like there's much in the way of governance. I, I know in a lot of European countries, the ministry of education, the more federal ministry, kind of has more direct control. I don't know how much 
supervision they do and, and evaluation and training they do of local people. But I think it's pretty clear that unless you have a strong hierarchy that kind of connects the ultimate demand to have good schools all the way down to the people who are teachers who are providing the education, that you kind of have a, a, a break in the system. And, it's, and you, then it de you depend upon a little bit on the luck of the school getting good principal, like in the Czech Republic. You depend upon the luck a little bit. It's not completely lucky because the higher income area, those parents are going to complain a lot if the school's not very good. But it really, I think, is harmful in the, in the areas in which people don't take as much control over the quality of, uh, of the education. But I, I'm, not pro, I, I, I'm not optimistic that we're going to be able to learn very much about superintendents. We're going to try to study whether, whether in a school system that's improving, the superintendent appears to be selecting principals well, and that the ones that are leaving appear to be the ones coming from the, the schools that are struggling. And that's probably as far as we'll get. Well, well hello, my, my name is Robert Warren from the Ministry of Education. Well, my, my question is pretty following uh, the question of a colleague, well, and it's focus on the selection of all the principles. Yeah, actually, uh, it's not complicated that will ever, ever made the Czech environment and, and the US system. But the, basically, I don't know, well, I, 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 you know, like, I, I was trying to do like, the general question of what are the best criteria and, and all this stuff, but actually, do you recommend the US system to the other countries? Like it's transferable to here or something? <laughs> You've heard about the description of, of the Czech system, yeah? Uh, well, you know, like, give us some kind of policy advice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. These days I'm having trouble recommending much about the U.S., but <laughs> I guess that's a complicated story. You know, I, I think the, the U.S. is really changing their system a lot because we had this system of, it's very decentralized educationally, and so there would be a, usually a state superintendent of schools, but they wouldn't have too much control. And the control was really at the municipality level. The town level often, or maybe towns would combine and have a single school district. And in most places, people vote for what we call a school board, right? A group of trustees who then evaluate and hire the superintendent. And that superintendent then supervises and hires and fires principals. I think in theory, it's sort of like corporate governance, where the corporation is, is, you know, is directed by a board of directors who are the major stockholders. Um, I don't think it works particularly well. And I think it really doesn't work very well in these big cities and, and very poor places. Because those school boards don't do, it's very hard to do a good job as a school board member. Because you really, I was a school board member. You really have to spend a lot of time accumulating information. And fortunately, because of my background, I could read statistical reports easily. And, and then you have to work with other board members to evaluate and hire principals, I mean a superintendent on the basis of who's going to be the best one for the job. And I can tell you that there's, it's a popularity contest, that in the US teachers are lobbying a lot. And so I think, and the real problem in large urban districts and small rural ones is people don't have many choices of alternatives. So in a suburban district like mine, if the schools start falling off, people are going to move. Housing prices are going to fall and there will be a lot of pressure to make changes. In a big city, like a big poor city like New York or, or LA or Chicago or Prague is a big city, you know, it's very bureaucratic, and you don't, have, you don't have a close connection between the pressure to have better schools and the decision-making about who leads them. And as I said earlier, I think in, in areas with immigrant families and poorer families, even though immigrant families tend to be among, in the U.S. at least, the most successful, you know, because they're often selected people who make the sacrifice to come, and they're most successful, they still are not very active in trying to, you know, really push for better... Um, schooling. I can give you one example, though, that in my town, which is a 
you know, upper middle class town with very good schools. The long serving principal of the, the lower secondary schools left. And they replaced her rather lazily with someone who had been in the school before. And people said, all oh, the teachers like her, rather than conducting a real search. And she turned out to be terrible. And now it's damaging the schools. And now the, the job of the new superintendent, the first job is going to be to have to fire her and rebuild the, the schools. It's still a lot of great teachers. I mean, there's still good schools. But you can see the deterioration even in a couple of years. So even in a, we sort of are in the ideal for the US system. You know, upper middle class place, parents have lots of alternatives in terms of where to live. And it still doesn't work that well. So these charter schools, which are alternatives that are independent schools, though part of the, the government system, I think have become very important to infuse some competition in, and particularly in poor areas, to give people alternatives. Even though many of them aren't very good, I think that having this kind of choice um, and, and pressure is a really promising innovation. Good evening, Professor It's an honor to be here with you. My name is Maya Pedinatva. And you were talking about effective principles, and I understand they are those who can improve student outcomes. Uh, have you observed any characteristics of these effective principles? For example, prior to becoming principal, were they teachers or managers, or what training did they take, or anything? What did you observe? Any characteristics? You know, I don't, when I was a school board member, I observed schools, but I'm an economist, so <laughs> I don't pretend to know a lot about, you know, about the operations of schools. I do most of my work using data. Um, but I think one of the, the most important findings um, economists have emphasized on schooling is not to try to kind of make a cookbook or say, if a principal has, someone has this experience, looks this way, had these grades, had, you know, all of these things. There was a time where business people said, we need our school principals to come from business. And it was a failure. And I really am of the view that we differ a lot from one another. And we differ a lot not only going into a job, but how, how observant we are, how willing we are to evolve and change and how, how, we're, how much we're able to have difficult conversations with one another to put the interests of the children, the community, before your colleagues and peers you have to work with every day. And so I think there's learning by doing. And I think that's one of the things that's so important is that it may be very hard to hire a good teacher or a good principal or a good superintendent on the basis of their characteristics from the past, which is why it's so important to evaluate them give them support, and ultimately remove people who are, don't turn out to be effective. So unfortunately, I don't, I don't think there is a good road map. Uh, also for the Minister of Education, uh, I have some other question to that. So I, I can see two mechanisms, at least, uh, how good principles can work. One, is, one could be through hiring of, or attracting better, better teachers. The second could be by creating a better environment in school. Mm -hmm. And I know it's hard to design them because they are obviously correlated. But I think it's so important because both could lead to different policies, especially through attracting uh, better teachers could be like a zero something to some extent. Mm -hmm. So could you speculate or elaborate a bit more on those two components and what could be, or if, if it's possible to, to, uh, to improve the second one, so to, to uh, improve the environment, or the skills principles have to improve the environment? I mean, on, on some level, again, I mean, you, many of you here know more about this than me because you're, you're in schools more than I am. I am the head of a department, and you know, you do, you make decisions and talk to people about the way they talk to one another about the standards that are set. I think principals have a, have a big influence on, for example, how women are treated, you know, about how people treat one another, what's expected of students. So it's hard to believe, you know, based, I think, on my own work as department head and based upon, you know, experiences in school, and I'm sure for many of you know more than, than I know, that this is important. And I think the, there's strong evidence that teachers can improve a lot. 
and that getting good feedback and having a you know strong reason to improve and having peers who are you know good educators and also dedicated to improve can be an important thing now i think what's very difficult is to try to identify the contributions of those various things now the one thing about the dallas system is the principals are evaluated so one of the things we're looking at is they're evaluated on many dimensions of their jobs and we're going to try and see if the principals who are evaluated better on these different dimensions, how related that appears to be to you know, the outcomes in the schools that we've been talking about. So I think the nice thing about the data <coughs> system, it's providing a lot of information. I um, mean, there was a study of schools of teaching called the MET study that did a lot of this for teachers, that rated teachers in a number of dimensions and then related those ratings to how well the teachers um, fostered growth of learning of their students, so then you can learn something about the importance of the various aspects of the job, like classroom management versus subject matter knowledge and things like that. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence of the result of the charter schools compared to regular public schools, and any reason for that? So we've done, we've done a lot of work on charter schools and so have some other people. The evidence is mixed. I think the evidence is mixed. I think we have a study which is just um, going to be published, which shows a lot of improvement in the quality of charter schools following the closure of a lot of schools that weren't very good and improvement of ones that stayed in and the opening of better schools. That's promising, you know, that's kind of what you'd expect if charter schools come under greater pressure. To, to be good. There is also important work done on charter schools in Massachusetts, particularly in Boston. These are no excuses schools. I don't know if you know about no excuses schools, but no excuses is, you know, the students are, many of them are very poor, and the mindset is no excuse. You're poor, you know, you, maybe your father went to jail, you know, your mother is struggling, you have brothers and sisters who are struggling. That's not an excuse and the kids are taught to work very hard, they have big behavior components, you know, you have to look people in the eye, and there has to be a lot of respect, and no tolerance for misbehavior, and the teachers work hard, and the kids are allowed to call the teachers. And these schools in Boston, there's lotteries to get in. You know what a lottery is, it's, if there's too many people who want to enter, it's, they pull, you know, numbers out of a hat, and they compare the outcomes of kids who get in versus the ones who don't get in, and the kids who get in do much better. So these particular subset of charter schools seem to really do a great job of educating poor kids. And I think that our work really gets at the broader set of charter schools, because lots of, it's like restaurants. There's lots of restaurants that aren't that good, they're not that crowded. If you take the crowded restaurants with a waiting line, People who get in are probably going to be happier with their meal that night than people who don't get in, right? Because these are the best places. But we're looking at whether, you know, having a more, you know, a more competitive environment where the schools have more autonomy, but also come under greater pressure to attract students um, and succeed is going to work. And I think, I wouldn't say the results are compelling yet, but I think they're promising that these pressures are good, and there's also promising results that they're getting the public schools to do a better, the traditional public schools to do a better job. And so, you can look at my website, or um, I can um, give some things to Daniel about some of the work that's been done on charter schools. Okay. Uh, so, the time is pressing, so if there is no other question, I will move to the final part, which is a couple of, uh, well, the first is just my conclusion, okay, which I take from this. Uh, I concluded that I'm not able at this moment to make any stronger policy advice for the Czech Republic uh, concerning school principles. I would be rather careful. It's still rather mm, new topic for the wider audience. But, but there is one conclusion, or three conclusions, that uh, we already know that school principles, and we feel it, that they are quite important for the functioning and final outcomes of education. And in that, it's important how we select them, how we prepare them, 
and how we supervise and evaluate them. So the debate definitely should be on these three elements uh, of the issue. That's what I take from today's seminar. So those few additional pieces of information are that on Thursday there is additional uh, seminar like that, uh, which will focus on uh, dual education, miracle of uh, dual education and training in Switzerland. And that will be followed by panel discussion by experts from here, Czech Republic, and from uh, the Switzerland. Uh, and uh, if you are, want to be informed about uh, events like that or studies of by IDEA, write to us, email, and we will put to you on our uh, mailing list. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to thank the Professor Stephen Rifkin for nice uh, second uh, public lecture for the Czech Republic. Thank you very much. <laughs> and everybody is invited for talk, uh, discussion uh, and uh, refreshment, which should be served behind my shoulders. I got these doors, which will appear shortly, and these doors. So you don't have to leave immediately.